the Mark Bryan Radio Program. The fellow that sits in studio with us has been on the program many times over the phone, but never in studio with us, so we're very excited about that. He is the largest selling comedy recording artist in history. You're Good the largest man. selling comedy recording artist in history, Jeff. It doesn't it seems like it should be somebody else, doesn't it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think that they say it's like I don't know. 18 million albums or something. God. Jeff Foxworthy is with us. Welcome to the show, Thank man. you. I, you know what? It, and I'm excited to be here because I've enjoyed doing this. We've done this show, you know, over the phone for 20 years yeah. probably. Yeah. So. <laughs> and I was like, oh, my God, I'm going in here live in person. So I was nervous. <laughs> uh, so things are good. Busy. Got a book. The book is uh, – this is your 20th? Uh, 28th book, I think. Good Lord. Uh, well, the book is called How to Really Stink at Work. A guide to making yourself fireproof while having the most fun possible. Yeah, well, it, and I don't know about the timing of this, uh, but uh, yeah, you know, before I did comedy, I was at IBM for five years, and 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 so people will say to me, Brian Hart, who who I wrote it with, we were sitting around one day filming Blue Collar TV. He said, I can't believe you worked at IBM for five years. And I said, Brian, I was there for five years. I didn't work there. <laughs> and so we started talking about everybody's worked with these slackers that that managed to get paid forever, <laughs> and they don't, they never do anything. And so that was kind of – but because when I was at IBM, it, I started in dispatch, and we had a boss that would – one of these guys that would walk around all the time and look over your shoulder to make sure you were working. Right. And so me and the guy next to me, every time we would see him come out of his office, we would dial his office number. We'd let him get about 15 feet out of the office, and we'd dial his number. And he would stop, and he would run back in there. And as soon as he'd get to the desk, we'd hang up on him. Brilliant. And we would do this to him 30 times a day. And we just found little ways to, to trim time off of the work day. Like my buddy would leave his car lights on every morning. He would, on purpose, leave them on. And somebody would come in and go, Dave, your lights are on. And then he would get up. You know, there's another 20 minutes you don't have to work. You got to go out and turn your lights wow. off. You got to work hard to think of those things. Oh I mean, yeah, yeah. Well, you know, and you want to. You don't want to get fired because you need the paycheck. Sure. But, but you also <laughs> want to make yourself a little bit unstable. You know, nobody wants to. Like I, one of the suggestions in the book is when you go to the to the public bathroom there at the office. Get in a stall and sing really loud, <laughs> like Christmas carols in July, because other people will talk about this. They're not going to fire you. And this is this is all. They're not going to fire you, but this is also going to keep you out of getting the promotion with more responsibility. Yeah, yeah. Which is what you're, you're trying to avoid the promotion because the, with the promotion comes responsibility, and who can have any fun with that kind of anvil hanging over their head? Right. <laughs> you're trying to avoid the promotion. I mean, it's a perfect gift for anybody that's just you know graduating and going into the workforce. <laughs> <laughs> the book is called How to Really Stink at Work, A Guide to Making Yourself Fireproof While Having the Most Fun Possible. Now, you're also doing uh, Are You Smarter Than a Fifth Grader? Yeah. We, uh, that's moving into syndication, right? Yeah, well, well the uh, we come back in primetime, I think, July 3rd, and we've got a lot. Of, Larry the Cable Guy is actually coming on to oh, play boy. with us, so that ought to be an interesting <laughs> minute and a half. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, but we're also doing a syndicated version that starts in the fall, so I'm out here right now filming those. Are, is there going to be another blue coll collar comedy tour? I, I hope before I die we get to yeah. do that's out of everything I've done in, in 25 years of doing this. That's the most fun thing I've ever done. But see, before we did, Larry and Ron had never made any money before the blue collar tour, and so now. They're out there. They don't want to split it. They're out there headlining oh, sure. their own deals, sure. and they don't want to split it four ways. And so I keep telling Larry, you know, when you get the four-wheeler paid off, call me, yeah. <laughs> and we'll go back out and do I it. I had a friend. I didn't get to see the Blue Collar Tour, but my next-door neighbors went. And so I specifically wanted to hear her reaction to it. She and her husband went. And the next day I said, so, so how was it? She said, well, I got a problem. And I said, yeah. She said, the problem was that you could not and did not stop laughing because every act was specifically killer. And there's no downtime. You know, periodically in a nightclub when you go, there's going to be four or five that blow. Yeah. So you get a chance to breathe. The Blue Collar Tour has been gigantically, hugely successful. Well, you know, it was one of those things when we started doing it. We all cleared four months. We were going to do it for four months. And we were having so much fun, we did it for three and a half years. It's crazy. And, 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 and it was funny. The first night... 
but because you know, I and I had gotten inspired by the Kings of Comedy because I when it sure. came out, I'd read a thing that said it was for the urban hip audience, and I called Ingball and said, "Boy, that's leaving a lot of people out." Uh, <laughs> and so, but but the the producers of the thing said, "Well, you need a, a a grand finale. You need something really big at the end." But I remember being a kid at my grandmother's house watching the Carol Burnett show, sure. and and I and, and my favorite thing was that you could tell how much they liked each other and when they made each other laugh yeah. and, and i said instead of doing something big why don't we do something m- small i mean just let us sit on stools and try to make each other laugh mm. and they were like i don't know if this is going to work or not and it wasn't something you could rehearse you didn't know if it was going to work right. and the first night we had nine thousand people and i'm like okay here we go and 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 i think that was people's favorite part of the night it, it, you look forward to it at the end yeah. that's the thing and and you know larry brings out a guitar you know what's coming up it's going to it's good well you know and and we've all known each other for so long it's kind of we know which buttons to push and yeah. and larry kind of if i look at larry when he starts on that stupid my sister you know, yeah. I, if i look at him i know i'm going to laugh <laughs> and so somebody said to me they said why is it when you're up there on the stool and larry's talking do you just stare at the floor and shake your head i said well i'm trying not to look at larry cuz i know i'll laugh which is what Larry wants me to do. Uh-huh. And Ron will sit next to me and just keep leaning over going, just look at him, just look at him. <laughs> and I'm shaking my head, no, I'm not looking at him. Well, it was the Blue Collar Tour that introduced uh, me to Ron White. Yeah. I had never... Uh, and now, whenever I get a chance to see an HBO special or a whatever, when he comes out and he's got an extra thick slug of scotch, yeah. I know it's going to be a good night. Yeah. <laughs> well, when we were when we started doing the blue collar thing, it actually got to the point on the first show I would make Ron mix <laughs> Coca Cola and Sprite together because it, if we had two shows, you weren't going to get a whole lot out of him in the second show if you did. <laughs> and, 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 and the things Ron talked about. It were things that we'd be sitting at Denny's at 2 in the morning. He's like, did I ever tell you all about the time I got kicked out of the bar? And he would tell these things, and we were like, Ron, you, you've got to tell this on the stage. You don't necessarily have to live it all, but... Drunk in public. Yes. Uh, now, uh, going back to Are You Smart in a Fifth Grader, the new season premieres Friday, July 3rd, and you were saying on Fox, uh, and you were saying in the green room, you're... You're, you're taping how many of these episodes? Well, the syndicated thing, we're doing 150 of them here over the course oh, of the next few geez. weeks. So. Over the next few weeks. Yeah, so, yeah, I've been, I've been with 10-year-olds all day. Less. I'm glad to see you guys who are much closer to 13 or 14 Around that, than yeah. 10. Yeah. Yeah. So. Yeah. Well, that's, the show's going great. Yeah, it? it's, it's fun to do. I mean, if you'd have asked me five years ago, would you do a game show, I would have laughed at you. And, uh, and I've had a lot of fun doing it. Jeff Foxworthy is here. If you have questions, feel free to call him right now, 1-800-955-5567. It's the Mark and Brian Radio Program. Welcome back. It's the Mark and Brian Radio Program. Jeff Foxworthy is here. His book is called How to Really Stink at Work, A Guide to Making Yourself Fireproof While Having the Most Fun Possible. Um, Jeff, I've always wondered, uh, you know, you've been doing that for, for so many years, and, you know, you're no longer known as, oh, that's the, just the guy that does the redneck jokes. Yeah. I mean, you, you've got, and I'm, I listen to you all the time on satellite radio on the blue collar. I, I love, I love those uh, stand-up uh, uh, radio stations. But how do you, how do you plan what you're going to do that night when you, when it's just you on stage? Because you've got so much material that you're, Fans, your core audience want they want you to do that one thing. Do that one thing. You, you tell that one story. You know, well, it's weird. I mean, I've been doing this. I've done nine albums. I've done twenty five Tonight shows. I've done two HBOs, two Showtimes, three blue collar movies. And and I mean, so over. Sometimes I don't even. You know, people will come up and go, "Will you tell that thing about when you saw your grandmother naked?" And I'm like. Yeah, how'd that go? <laughs> yeah. uh, so, I mean, and then they tell it, and you go, oh, that was funny. Yeah, I'll tell that. But, you know, I mean, that's kind of the fun of it is you go out there and you try to figure it out every night. It's like, all right, who do we have tonight? Do we have married people? Do we have single people? Do we have partiers? Do we have, you know, and so you throw things out there and go, oh, they're liking the, you know, whatever. So when you're not touring, do you still go to the, to uh, comedy clubs and work on new stuff? Yeah, you know, it's. It, I have found it's, it's very hard to develop new stuff in front of, Ten or twelve thousand people. You really have to get into that economy, economy, comedy club setting, where you know. And I'll go out there and do some regular material, and then say, "All right, guys, I'm working on some new stuff." Because you don't, oh, you'll you tell don't, them. You don't know. I mean, that's the amazing thing about comedy. After twenty five years, you would think you would know. Is this funny or is this not funny? Mm-hmm. But the audience is the only one that's right. And and, and the things that I think, oh, this is going to kill. 
you know, it just lays there. And sometimes I think this is stupid and people are snotting on themselves. And, so. and totally understand if you can't do this, but the story you told us about the Larry the Cable Guy joke, can you do that? Oh, yeah. Well, you, well, oh, listen to this. This is great. Because, well, as a comic, you know, you kind of get your own style, which is fun having buddies that are comics because their style is different. So Larry, uh, like four or five months ago, was working on a new album. And, and he writes me, you know, sends me an email, and he says, I've got all these premises that I can't finish. Can you help me? And, and one, one of them was, he said, uh, he said, I used to date this girl that, uh, that was a magician. He said, and one night we kind of got to fooling around, and he said, I thought she was putting a condom on me, and I turned on the light, and it was a Chinese handcuff. Right. And he said, the, the harder I tried to pull the thing off, the tighter it got. Mm. And then he said, I have nothing else after that. It's not a joke. It's just a premise. <laughs> and so I wrote him back, and I said, yeah, I finally had to call my brother and get him to come over and put his wiener in the other end of it and walk towards me. <laughs> <laughs> and did it work? Oh, he, he did call. Yeah, he said, "Oh, it killed, dude. It yeah. killed." Dude. <laughs> That's great. Uh, all right, let's take some phone calls. For uh, let's go to Jim on line seven. Hey, Jim, you're on the air with Jeff Foxworthy. Hey, Jeff, what's happening? Hey, man, how are you? Hey, when are we and you going to elk hunting? <laughs> I can't go before this fall. <laughs> Uh, can, we, can we expect you to see you on the Outdoor Channel this year? Yeah, you know what? Yeah, that's kind of my hobby. I, uh, I live in Georgia, and I love to uh, to bow hunt. And, uh, in fact, I just went to New Zealand. I turned 50, and uh, that's where my wife sent me bow hunting in New Zealand. Oh, that? That was, uh, New Zealand's absolutely gorgeous. It's uh, it's not a whole lot of people and a lot of uh, sheep, but uh, just beautiful, <laughs> just uh, beautiful country. Now, um, if you don't mind sharing, you, you live uh, in Atlanta or the suburbs mm-hmm. around, yeah. and you've got a nice big spread there. Yeah, I have. A, well, I mean, I kind of grew up out in the country, so I have a farm there, which, I mean, I love my time in L.A., but that was the one thing. You know, living in L.A., you ain't having a farm in L.A. <laughs> a farm is an acre here, so... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I've got a big. I, we have like tractors and bush hogs, and I, in fact, last year I was one of my favorite things. I take my kids to school, and then I run down there and get on the tractor. And bush hogs like the big grass cutting things you see on the side of the highway. Right. And I, and I'm and I'm down there bush hogging a the field, and my phone is ringing. I can feel it vibrate, and I pull it out, and I'm like, I'm on the tractor. Hold on, I'm on the tractor. I can't hear you. And well, it was Mark Burnett uh, calling me from L.A., and he goes, In all my years in show business, I don't believe anyone has ever said, Hold on, I'm on the tractor. <laughs> <laughs> because this really isn't an act, is it? You really, you really are a redneck. <laughs> uh, let's go to Chris on line eight. Chris, first of all, welcome back, man. You just got back from Iraq. Oh, lost it. No, out? no. He no. wanted to thank you for coming. No, in I want to thank show, yeah. Chris. I want to thank you for your service. You, the, the, you are the folks that are the real heroes. And I would think that you going over there doing your act to a really appreciative audience, they must have just oh, roared. Y- you know what? I, you cannot say enough about those people. It's even when we were doing the blue collar thing, we would always try to go visit a base or go visit a hospital. And every time we did the movie, we were like, "All right, the first cases that come off, please send these overseas." I mean, because those, you know, a laugh. That's the, and you guys know this. The thing about laughter, I always said it was that release valve that keeps the boiler from exploding. Mm-hmm. I mean, we all have bad crap in our life, but it's being able to laugh once in a while keeps you from just going crazy. Nobody, I don't know, if there's anybody who's been more consistently funny and involved in the comedy business than you you've been doing this 25 years yeah <laughs> wow and you're right you were talking about you'd think after a while you'd know when something's funny and do you not find it uniquely interesting i, I don't have any experience with this but you probably one night you tell a joke and it slays them and the very same joke the next night falls flat yeah i mean and i can always tell when i'm working on new stuff I, if something bombs there's one person laughing and it's my wife in the back of the car <laughs> my wife loves to see me go down the toilet she's like oh my god that was so bad nobody laughed at that that was awful thanks honey but you know but here's the cool thing for me and and if you, it's, i've gotten to do a lot of different things and you keep thinking well there's you know you've run out of things to do but i did my first children's book last year called mm-hmm. dirt on my shirt and then i did one this year well after 25 years i'm reading in kindergartens and first grades i mean it's, it, and they're and they're so funny <laughs> so i'm reading in this uh first grade class and the teacher tells me she said i gotta share this story with you she said last week the school had say no to drugs and alcohol week and she said so the first graders project was they made a big banner and they put it on the wall and said we pledge to say no to drugs and alcohol and then they had all the first graders come over and sign their name to it and she said we get down to the end of the line and there's one little boy that said Miss Cox, I'm not going to sign the banner. And she's like, well, Justin, why not? And he said, 
I'm pretty sure I'm going to have a couple of beers. <laughs> <I'm> like, <laughs> what has happened to you in the first grade that you're already sure you're going to have a couple of beers? Wow. <laughs> Travis, you're uh, on there with Jeff Foxworthy. How are you guys doing today? All right. <laughs> Good, Travis. Uh, Jeff, I got a question for you. All right. What is the proper way to make a redneck hot tub? Uh, the the pro- well, you can put a trolling motor. I, I, I don't know a trolling <laughs> motor in a wash tub. What I, I'm suspecting that you've actually done this. Oh uh, yes, we have, and it didn't come out as proper as we thought. What now? Tell me what you did, Trav. We took a tarp. And we uh, put it in the bed of the truck, and we duct taped it. <laughs> and uh, we had the bright idea to take the hose from the exhaust and put it in there. Oh, oh my gosh! Geez. So you're so you're churning carbon monoxide right there into the water that you're sitting in. Yes. Yeah. And smoking. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know what? It's not really a good redneck experiment if somebody doesn't end up in the emergency room. So, very uh, nice, Trav. The book is called How to Really Stink at Work, A Guide to Making Yourself Fireproof While Having the Most Fun Possible. And, of course, the new season of Are You Smarter Than a Fifth Grader premieres Friday, July the 3rd, 8 o'clock on Fox. How cool to see you in the studio with us, man. How cool for you to have me. And you know what? Thank you, guys. You guys, for for a couple of decades, have understood the value of laughter. And you've helped so many comics. But, I mean, not just comics, but people sitting out there stuck in traffic. Let, Laughing's a good thing. It, you, you need it to get through your day. So thank you for what you've done. Nice of you, Jeff. Come back anytime. You betcha. Good to see you.